Well, we're going to talk about the importance of water testing, why you want to get it tested, and what it, what it will tell you. So why are we focusing on water? As you all know, water carries pathogens. And it can carry all these different foodborne illness pathogens like E. coli and Salmonella and Shigella and Giardia and Cyclospora and Norwalk virus and hepatitis. And actually, water is the number one factor in contamination of fresh produce. So it's important for everyone because everyone's using water at some point on their farm. And it's a single critical point that's capable of amplifying any error in your management during production, harvest, or post-harvest. And down here is a good example of this. Whether you're washing things in little five-gallon buckets or washing them in a big flume like the guys out in California do, if you have a pathogen in there, anything you put in that bucket is going to get that pathogen on it and it's going to multiply. So we all know farm water applications can include things like irrigation and pesticide application and frost protection and post-harvest handling. Anywhere where water is coming in contact with produce on your farm, you need to know the quality of that water and make sure that it's as safe as possible for your customers. So water sources. We have various water sources throughout Tennessee. A lot of surface water sources like rivers, ponds, streams, and irrigation ditches. This is a picture of the Cumberland River up here. We also have a lot of wells in Tennessee, especially as you move out west. And then folks that are using municipal water, and we'll talk about all of those. The surface water sources are generally going to be the riskiest, and then the wells, depending on your well and the quality of the well, are going to be less risky, and municipal water is guaranteed by your municipality, and by law it has to be safe for drinking. So that's generally a safe bet. So surface water. Ponds can easily be contaminated if livestock or wild animals have access to that water. And if you have a pond, it, it's pretty hard to keep any wildlife out of that pond. So there's a good chance that that water can be contaminated. And I'm going to show you some of the results of our water tests, and you'll see that later on. But flooding of the streams and rivers is also a source of microbial and other forms of pollution. And a lot of folks in this room can attest to that from the flood we had here couple of summers ago. Well water sources. Wellhead, the wellhead is a place where the risk of potential contamination is high. And it's really important that you have a well that's properly constructed because an improperly constructed well is going to be a source of contaminants to enter. Here's a good example of a well that doesn't have anything on it. As Jim was talking about the cisterns before, we did used to be inoculated and now we're a little more sensitive. We need to take precautions. This one has the cap on the well right at ground level and that's a good way to also invite contaminants in. You want to have that up off the ground, try to reduce the potential for contaminants to enter your water system. For well integrity, Generally, you want to divert any runoff away from that wellhead, and your casing should extend 12 to 24 inches above the ground to prevent that contamination. The outside of the casing is going to need to be grouted to a depth of more than 25 feet or more, and the casing is generally surrounded by a concrete pad. It's also important to put as much distance as possible between water sources and your potential contaminants, and that can be a manure pile, it can be a gas tank, it can be the area where you mix your pesticides, and all sorts of things. So you want to think about what you're doing close to your water source and make sure it's not going to be a source of contamination. For, for municipal water, does anybody recognize this water tower? This is from Loudoun, city of Loudoun historic water tower there. But generally, municipal water is going to have the lowest risk for contamination, but it's going to have the highest cost, especially depending on how far you have to get it from the source of that municipal water into your field. And by law, water from the municipal system has to be potable. However, a lot can happen between the water source and your field. So if you are using municipal water, the food safety standard is you get the analysis from your municipality, stick it in your food safety plan, but it would also be smart to check it right where it's coming out and going on to your crop because a lot can happen in that pipe from the municipal source to your field. So we're going to talk a little bit about irrigation methods as well. 
and water quality and how and when it is used and the characteristics of that crop are going to affect your risk. So examples of increased risks are overhead irrigation versus drip irrigation because that overhead, if you have pathogens in the water, they're getting all over the edible portion of your crop that's above ground. And then, of course, crops with that ed edible portion in direct contact with any water are going to be more at risk than crops that don't contact the water. Of course, with drip irrigation, that's less risky, but you're never going to eliminate your risk completely because there's always folks, when you're going through the system, you get a leak in your drip system and it's shooting all over your plants. So we're talking about reducing risk, but there are still other factors in there that you can never be 100% risk-free. So water testing. The microbiological testing is used to track the safety of your water and not for daily monitoring activities, but the records can be very important if in the event of an outbreak. So you want to make sure that you're documenting the results of each water test and keeping them for comparison purposes, and you want to look at any changes in your results that might help identify problems in your system. So when do we want to sample? For municipal sources, again, you can just ask your municipality for a copy of the water analysis. And it's also good to sample it again at the point of where it's in contact with the crop. For wells, you want to begin sampling your water about 60 days before you start your irrigation program for the season, and then again during peak use in the season. And for surface water sources, it's generally recommended that you check it before the start of the season, at the peak of the season, and then when you're harvesting your crops. Where do you want to sample? You want to collect the water sample as close to the point of use as possible. So here we have this person right out in the field with the water coming out, and that's where you'd want to collect it if you can. You want to so select a sampling area that's going to be clear of any dense litter or vegetation. How to sample. Generally, if you're working with a lab, they're going to send you or give you the bottles that you need to take the sample in, but you want to make sure that you're using sterile sample bottles. And you want to label that bottle with your farm name, the water source type, so if it's a surface water source or a well or municipal water, the date that you're taking it, and the time of the sample. Because for these water samples, the timing is really critical. You want to make sure that you're getting them to the lab as soon as possible. And there's time limits on how long you can wait to get them there, so that time is important. When you're collecting this, the water from equipment, like a well, or you, you're turning it on in the field, you want to make sure you're letting that system run for one to three minutes before you sample, and that will flush out anything that might be right there at the head there. How to sample. Here are a couple examples of sampling out of a pond. If you're sampling a pond, generally it's recommended that you're going to subsample from several different locations around the pond, and you want to make sure you're taking that sample from about one to two feet below the surface of the water. You also want to make sure you're getting out away from the edge of the pond, so you want to be about six feet from the side of the pond as well, or more. And a really important thing is when you're taking the sample in either a pond or a stream or a river, you want to, if you can, get that bottle underwater before you take the cap off because there's a lot of uh, things on the surface of the water that can contaminate your sample. So if possible, you can get that weighed out if you have a pair of waders like this person, get in the middle, stick the bottle underwater, and then take the cap off and fill it up. And that can pre prevent contamination. Also, you don't want to collect any debris that might be floating on the top, or you don't want to scrape the sides or the bottom of the water source because that's going to affect your tur turbidity and it could also have other contaminants in it. The other way you can do it is with a pole, and if you're using a pole, obviously you can't take the cap off once the pole's out there, so you want to just make sure that if you're using a pole to sample your water, you get it in there quickly, try to cut through that surface quickly. When you're done sampling, you want to make sure that you're immediately placing the samples in coolers with ice packs, and you want to deliver the sample to your lab as soon as possible. For some tests, they want it to, in the lab within six hours, and for other parameters, generally it's no longer than 24 hours. And you want to check with the lab that you're using for any specific instructions that they might have. The labs that we most commonly use in Tennessee Microback Lab is in Merrillville, and they're the lab that we've been working with for our studies. 
And for the uh, water samples that we've done, it's about $75 a sample. In West Tennessee, A&L Labs is in Memphis, and this is just important. If you're close to one of these labs, it's easier to get the samples there rather than trying to drive across the state and get a sample in within six hours. And then in Middle Tennessee, Tennessee Tech has the Center for Management, Utilization, and Protection of Water Resources. And this is actually probably the most economical choice in Tennessee for water quality testing. And it's $45 a sample for the parameters that we'll talk about in a second. There are more labs that you could use, but these are three of the most common labs. So interpreting your results. A typical test is generally going to consist of your pH, conductivity, turbidity, and generic E. coli bacteria. In addition to E. coli, there are other indicator organisms, including total coliforms and fecal coliforms. The total coliforms are any coliform present in the environment. And there's going to be naturally occurring coliforms in the soil. So it's not a very good indication of foodborne illness organisms because it's generally an environmental thing. The fecal coliforms are again an indicator that there's been some contamination either through human or livestock manure. However, it still is not in a, in a what's the word I'm looking for here? It's not a um, guarantee that you have some sort of foodborne illness problem there. Um, and the E. coli is the same way. This isn't checking for any specific E. coli. E. coli is present in all mammals' guts, and so it's just that it's there. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have an issue, but it is an indication that there could be contamination in your system and you want to investigate further. So while none of these organisms provide a good indication of the quality and safety for ag production, they are the best tests that we currently have, and that's why we're using the generic E. coli test. So pH. pH is the measure of the hydrogen ion, hydrogen ion concentration in your water. And low pH is going to be caused by acids or acid-generated salts and dissolved CO2. High pH is going to be from carbonates or bicarbonates, hydroxides, phosphates, silicates, and borates. And water samples, generally we want them to be between 6.5 and, and 8.5 and for their pH. And if they deviate from those values, then you want to check and see what's going on to cause those abnormal values. You especially want to check if your pH is lower than 6.5 because then you have corrosion potential on your plumbing or your pumps or your storage tanks. So that's important. Conductivity is a measurement of the availability of water or of the ability of water to conduct electric current. And it's also an indicator of salinity or mineral content of water. And greenhouse growers are very up on their electrical conductivity, and they test it with an EC meter quite regularly. But it's measured in micromoles per centimeter, and the values can range from 0 to 5,000. And generally, for irrigation water, a reading of 0 to 500 is considered excellent, and 500 to 1,500 is considered good, and then on up. If you're getting in above 3,000, then it's generally a sign of poor irrigation water quality. And this is just an example of the effects of salinity. They're using a different measurement here, but you get the idea. This is deci Siemens per meter, just another um, unit that can measure the conductivity. And you can see as you're becoming more saline, your relative yield is going down. So if your salinity is near zero, you're getting 100% yield. And then as you go, it's getting closer closer to no yield. And it's going to vary depending on your crop. And there are sensitive and moderately sensitive and moderately tolerant and tolerant crops. And a list of those are here. So some of the sensitive crops are things like almond and apple and apricot, onions, peas, beans, and carrots. And then the moderately sensitive crops are corn, grape, peppers, tomatoes, cabbage, and potatoes. And the moderately tolerant things are olives and beets and asparagus and spinach. And the tolerant things are none of the vegetables. A lot of forage crops are more tolerant, and cotton is more tolerant. Turbidity is a measurement of the suspended particulate matter in your water, and that's going to interfere with the passage of a beam of light through the water. So you can imagine if you're using a surface water source, you're going to have higher turbidity than if you have municipal water that's going to be clear. 
And the materials that are going to contribute to turbidity are going to include silt and clay and organic material and microorganisms. So it could be an indicator that you might have microorganisms. It could be an indicator that you have a lot of clay in your water. So uh, the values are generally reported in nephilometric turbidity units. And pure distilled water would have zero turbidity or no turbidity. In. High levels can increase the total available surface area of solids in that water, just meaning that if you do have microbes in there, the bacteria can cling on to those, that surface area and have more area to multiply. However, there are currently no uniform guidelines for acceptable turbidity values for irrigation water. Of course, the closer to zero you are, the better off you'd be. And then generic E. coli. The uh, standards for generic E. coli have been taken from the Leafy Greens Marketing Agreement, and they're derived from the EPA Recreational Water Standards. So that's the swimming water standards. When the edible portion of the crop is not contacted with water, the acceptance criteria is less than or equal to 126 uh, MPNs, which stands for most probable num number. Another way to look at it is the colony forming units, their equivalent units, they're calculated slightly differently. And that's with a geometric mean of five different samples. The acceptance criteria is less than or equal to 576 MPNs per 100 milliliters of water for any single sample. When the edible portion of the crop is in contact with water, the acceptance criteria is still 126 for a geometric mean of your five samples or less than 235 MPNs per 100 mils for a single sample. So these are the values on your test that you are looking at. So now what? If your sample exceeds the limit for generic E. coli, you want to stop irrigation and start a remediation action. And what are some of those remedial actions? You want to stop using that water for foliar and direct contact with the edible portion of the crop. And you want to wait until your water returns within those compliance levels to be safe. You also want to conduct a survey of your water source and the system of where that water is going throughout your system to see where you might have a breach in the system, where you might be getting that contamination. You also want to eliminate, of course, any identified contamination sources you might have. So that might be trying to fence off a pond if you don't have it fenced off and you've seen the deer wandering over to it. Or it could be capping your well if it doesn't have a cap on it. For wells, you also want to perform that sanitary survey and or treat the well. Well shocking, things of that nature. You also want to retest the water as close to the source as possible and at that sampling point after your sanitary survey and take the remedial action. That will narrow down where you might be getting that contamination in the system. Is it right at the source or is it somewhere within your pipes and before it gets out to your field so you can narrow down where it might be. If any of your samples are over 235 most probable number per 100 mils, you want to repeat that sanitary survey or remedial action until you get those values below that level. And if you don't have an explanation for the contamination, you need to try a more aggressive sampling program in order to figure out what's going on. Oftentimes, if you're using a surface water source, which you'll see in a minute when I show you some of the data from our water tests, it can be that you just had a flood event. If you, take, if you have a big rain and you take your sample right after that big rain, you're going to have higher numbers in a surface water source. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about our UT Irrigation Water Quality Study. And this is part of the National Irrigation Water Quality Database, which is out of Cornell. And the idea of this survey is to provide a better understanding of water quality that's used for fresh produce production. Anywhere in that chain from the irrigation and post-harvest water uses. And we want to determine the water quality so that any decisions regarding national irrigation water quality standards can be science-based. That EPA recreational water standard was chosen as the standard from uh, the Leafy Greens marketing folks, but there's not a lot of science behind that number. So this is trying to get some of the science behind there. What is the irrigation water quality for fresh produce producers across the United States? Are those EPA standards reasonable? Are there other standards we should be looking at? Lastly, we want to provide irrigation water quality data to you, the growers, so that you can make decisions about the use of your water based on its quality and you can be prepared for any third-party audits that you might be required to have. 
So we started this study back in 2010, and we tested 28 irrigation sources from 12 farms across the state. 12 of those were surface water sources, 14 were wells, and two were municipal water sources. And we sampled three times throughout the season. And the analysis we used included those terms that we just went over with you, the quantified generic E. coli, specific conductance, turbidity, and pH. And of the 84 samples we took in 2010, we found only one sample that was above the allowable colony forming units per 100 mils for E. coli. And this sample was taken from a surface water source and it was shortly after a heavy rain event. So that's what I was talking about. You have a heavy rain in sample, you can find elevated levels of E. coli. And here's the summary of our results. In 2010, we found that our pH ranged from 5.9 in a well source to 8.9 in a pond, and our conductivity ranged anywhere from 50 to 705, which are all good range for vegetable irrigation. The turbidity ranged from no turbidity detected to 80, and the generic E. coli ranged from no E. coli to 860 CFUs per mil, and that was the farm that I mentioned was a surface source and it was right after a, a big rain event. So if we break down those different water sources, you can see the municipal water. We still did find two colony forming units of E. coli in some of our, in one of our samples. In the well, the E. coli ranged from zero to 26 colony forming units. In a pond and river, you see that we didn't have any samples that had no E. coli, there's always going to be some present in a surface water source. In the pond, it ranged from 7 to 240, and in the rivers, it ranged from 45 to 860. In 2011, we tested 30 irrigation sources on 13 farms across the state. 11 of those were surface water sources, and 19 were wells. Again, we sampled three times throughout the production season. Same sort of analysis, and of those 90 samples that we took, four samples were above the allowable limits for colony forming units of E. coli. And these again were taken from surface water sources. So again, it's assessing that risk and the water that you have available to you. Again, here's our ranges. The pH in 2011 ranged all the way down to 4.3, and this kept coming up. We tested this farm three times, and every time their pH was extremely low. And they concluded that it was the uh, makeup of their soil that was causing that low pH, the rocks down deep in the well. Our high was 10.8, and that was again in a pond, and that was one sampling, and that value went down on subsequent samplings. The conductivity ranged from 45 to 635, so again, good range for vegetable production. Turbidity, low turbidity again, none detected to 60 NTUs. The generic E. coli in 2011 ranged from 0 to 620. Again, again, you see in the well, we had from no colony forming units to 71. And then the surface water sources ranged anywhere from one colony forming unit in the spring up to 620 in streams at various times throughout the season. So irrigation water quality for 2012, we're looking for farms to sample. The sheet's going around. Our sampling's going to begin in April, and we will take three to four samples throughout the season. The samples are going to be analyzed for those same things, quantified generic E. coli, specific conductance, pH, and turbidity. The growers are provided with a copy of all their water testing results to stick in your food safety plan. It's at no cost to you. And the results are anonymously added to the National Water Quality Irrigation Database. So you're not identified in any way. If you have higher levels of E. coli, no one's going to come find you and say, hey, you need to do something. It's all between I see it and you see it, and we're the only ones who know. Nobody else knows. And if you give me 20 bucks, I won't tell anybody. <laughs> so if you're interested, <laughs> individually, <laughs> so if you're interested, please sign up on the sheet that's going around or come and talk to me. And I'd be happy to answer any questions either now or later. And if there aren't any questions, we can move on to the next person. Any questions about any of that? All right. Oh, Will. Does it, do you find it unusual that the streams have more of E. coli than 
Um, yeah, I would think that's more unusual because it's flowing water and ponds are stagnant, so that is a bit unusual. But it's going to vary by the stream and what's going on upstream. So it's really, you know, you can't tell. If it's a pond that's well protected, as well as you can protect a pond, then, yeah, you just have to know the other environmental factors that are going on there. <laughs> 